Hello Internet! Today we should finally get our Pentax Electro Spotmatic working again. In the previous videos we established that most of the parts of the electronics of the camera are working and we repaired those that did not. Besides the battery compartment only one of the CDS cells was broken, but this required replacing both CDS cells and rebuilding the log compression and log expansion networks because all of these parts must be precisely matched to each other. In this video we will check the remaining parts and we will go through a full calibration of the electronics of this camera. Let's first check the timing contact from pin 4 to ground. This contact is here and pin 4 is connected to the white wire going up here and whenever the shutter of the camera is cocked, this pin 4 should be connected to camera body ground. Right now the shutter is released, but as soon as I cock the shutter, we should measure continuity between pin 4 and pin 12. And the contact should be broken as soon as the shutter is released. Let's see. Seems to work perfectly. The contact works fine and later we will adjust it precisely so that the electronics get the timing signal via pin 4 at exactly the right time. Next let's check the mirror box contact going to pin 3. This contact should normally be closed when the mirror is down and it should connect pin 3 to pin 9 via the internal resistive dividers of the camera body. So right now I have the multimeter connected to pins 3 and 9 and we see that there is about 30 kilo ohms of resistance between those. So currently they are connected. I have the camera in bulb mode and when I release the shutter the mirror goes up and the multimeter shows an open circuit. In this state there should be no conductivity at all, the contact should be completely open. As soon as the mirror goes down again, the contact closes and we see the 30 kilo ohms again. Finally, let's check the electrical contacts of the stop-down switch. Right now we are in open aperture metering mode. So pin 9 should be connected to the yellow wire here, which goes to the aperture potentiometer ring. When we switch the camera to manual mode, that is to stop down measuring mode, the switch is now locked in the upper position. Continuity should be broken, it is. And instead P9 should now be connected to the wiper of a trimming potentiometer that is um, right here and I can actually reach the center of this potentiometer from the top. You see they are connected. As soon as I switch back to open aperture measuring mode this connection is broken and pin 9 and the yellow wire are connect it again. So this switch is also working perfectly fine. The camera is now ready for calibration. So let me tell you a little bit about the process and why it is a bit of a challenge with the Electrospotmatic. The Electrospotmatic is not a calibration friendly device. There is no simple rule such as if the camera underexposes in bright light, turn this knob clockwise and so on. Since the camera uses no ICs, the designers had to achieve its functionality with the minimum number of components. They could not spare any extra circuitry in order to make calibration easier. As a result of this, all the trimming resistors are wired into the circuit in a very simple way and therefore changing one of these resistors usually affects the operation of the circuit in many ways. And a single trimming resistor is usually not clearly assigned to one easily observable behavior. A trial and error approach to calibration is therefore quite hopeless and we need to follow a clear logical procedure to get good results. Also note that both the location and function of the trimming resistors vary somewhat between different board revisions. 
In this video I will discuss 11 degrees of freedom for calibration. On the electrical side we have 5 trimming resistors easily accessible on the bottom of the main circuit board and 5 more trimming resistors under the top cover of the camera on the camera body. The one mechanical degree of freedom we will discuss is an adjustable contact in the timing switch connecting pin 4 to ground. There are of course many more mechanical degrees of freedom in the camera that must be calibrated correctly, but since I'm not a camera repair expert, I cannot tell you how to correctly calibrate all these degrees of freedom. Mechanical calibration of the shutter should be done first, because correct operation of the shutter is the basis for the electronic shutter control. One of the 10 trimming resistors is for calibration of the battery jack, and that is so straightforward that for now I will ignore it. The remaining degrees of freedom can roughly be divided into three groups. Those for slope calibration, those for offset calibration and those for timing calibration. Where slope always refers to the change of certain voltages per stop of light or exposure, while offset refers to an overall constant up or down shift of the voltage. It makes sense to do the calibration in this order going from slope to offset to timing, because generally changing a slope parameter will also upset the offset calibration and changing the offsets will have effects on the correct timing calibration. Here's the calibration sequence I came up with in more detail. At the root of all calibrations is the timing or log expansion circuit. And we already got this working correctly in previous episodes. Important degrees of freedom were the V charge voltage set by VR5 and a resistor in the discharge network that determines short to medium times. In our case we actually removed it and replaced it with a fixed resistor. The log expansion slope is ultimately defined by the characteristics of the diodes in the discharge network and the trimming of the log expansion only serves to even out the slope in the shorter times to be the same as the one for the longer times determined by the diode. Once this log expansion slope is set, all the rest of the circuit has to be calibrated to match it. And the first function that has to be matched to the slope is log compression. We also dealt with this in previous episodes. Log compression is mainly defined by the diode or diode chain connected to pin 9 and by resistors in the log compression network. Some fine tuning of the log compression slope can be achieved by modifying the VREC voltage supply by trimming VR4. Since we already have done steps 1 and 2, the next step for us is meter calibration. Trimming resistor VR2 is used for the meter slope calibration. VR2 is in series with the meter coil and its resistance must be set such that the change of voltage that corresponds to one stop also causes a one stop change in the exposure time indicated by the meter. Normally you would expect to have two trimming parameters to set up an approximately linear indicator like the exposure time meter. But the camera gives us only this one trimming resistor for the slope. Therefore the overall offset of the meter cannot be trimmed. It is rather that the offset at which the meter calibration will happen to fall will determine the offset calibrations we will need to do in further steps of the procedure. Here's my setup for calibrating the meter in the viewfinder. The camera is connected to its PCB with one exception, using this jumper I have disconnected pin 3 from the camera body. This is to avoid any influence of the resistive dividers in the camera when we are forcing a voltage on pin 3. For forcing the voltage I use a function generator and it is set to generate a very slow square wave with a frequency of 0.2 Hz and an amplitude that corresponds to 10 stops difference at pin 3. And this difference of about 1.4 volts at pin 3 should make a difference of 10 stops 
indicated on the meter. For this calibration, it is important to remain under the threshold of the comparator to avoid any distortion caused by the action of the comparator. I will now increase the DC offset by 100 millivolts at a time. I see the needle move from slightly above one second to about one over 125 second exposure. So the needle swings by a lot less than 10 stops for this voltage difference that should correspond to 10 stops difference. This means that the trimming resistor for trimming the meter is set to a too high resistance and I need to lower it. Now that I lowered the trimming resistance, the meter is going up above a thousandth of a second, so I need to lower the DC offset again to get it within range. And I need to repeat this procedure of adjusting the trimming resistor and then adjusting the DC offset until I get the needle swinging perfectly from one second to one thousandth of a second. The trimming resistor was giving me some problems, so I treated it with some tuner spray and now I've got it adjusted perfectly so that the meter indication is switching between exactly one second and a thousandth of a second over the period of the square wave. In order to check the linearity of the meter, I will now reduce the amplitude to 80% of the earlier value. So instead of plus minus five stops, we should get a swing of plus minus four stops around one thirtieth of a second. With an amplitude of 1.132 volts, the meter now swings down to half a second, which is perfect, but when it swings up, it only goes to somewhere between 1 over 250 and 1 over 500 of a second. So we seem to have a bit of a problem with a quite non-linear response of the meter, which is not too surprising. We will need to find a compromise of the settings to get reasonably accurate meter readings over the full range. I found a good compromise in the settings now, I think, and I've got with the full amplitude of 1.415 volts, I have the needle swinging from one second to somewhat above a thousandth of a second. And this is needed to get the stops to match in the inner parts of the scale. Let's now calibrate the step size of the aperture potentiometer. We will do it using this trimming resistor up here. And as a preparation, I have already measured some voltages in the resistive divider with respect to pin 6, which is the negative of the floating voltage supply. When I turn the aperture dial from f over 2.8 to f over 16, this is a difference of 5 stops and we should therefore see a difference of 707.5 millivolts at pin 3. So let's check what we actually get. In order to exclude the influence of other variables, I am measuring the voltage difference between pin 9 and pin 6. Now at f over 2.8 we get 5.393 volts. Changing to F over 16 we get 6.149 volts. The voltage difference is 756 millivolts, so slightly too large by about 7%. This means that we need to proportionally reduce the voltage across the aperture potentiometer in order to get a somewhat smaller step size. I've calculated that we should get the correct step size when I increase the voltage across the trimming resistor VR11 to 5.194 volts. I have put some tuner spray on the trimmer 
and I've used some acetone to soften the lacquer that was sealing the trimmer to hopefully make this adjustment easier. I'm now measuring the top of the trimming resistor with respect to pin 6. We are currently at 5.02 volts roughly. So I need to increase the resistance a bit. It's extremely fiddly to adjust. 5.1973. I think that's quite close. So let's check again the difference we get for the five aperture stops. We are now at F over 16, 6.254, going to F over 2.8. Didn't want to release the shutter, but that shouldn't make any difference. And we have a difference of 708 millivolts, only half a millivolt off of our target value. And I think we'll leave it like this because there's no chance that I will get a better result by fiddling anymore with this trimmer. Next we must calibrate the other side of the floating resistive divider that is responsible for the ASA film speed potentiometer. This side is more complicated because we have two trimming resistors and we must adjust two degrees of freedom. In addition to the step size for the ASA film speed dial we also have to adjust the overall offset between pins 3 and 9 that determines the overall exposure. Let's first measure the status quo. For 100 ASA and 1 times compensation, we see an offset of 3.627 from pin 3 to pin 6. I have now set the camera to 25 ASA and 4 times exposure compensation. And here we get 3.188. Now at the other end with 1600 ASA and 1 half times exposure compensation. 4.156 volts. So currently for this 9 stop difference we get only 968 millivolts of voltage difference, which is about 107.6 millivolts per stop. It means we need to increase the voltage across the film speed potentiometer quite a bit, but we also need to consider what we want to do to the overall offset. I have calculated which values I need to achieve at the top and bottom end of the film speed potentiometer. We are now seeing the upper end of the film speed potentiometer and I should get it to 5.128 volts. Now the lower end I should get it to 3.669 volts. Adjusting the upper end again. Getting very close. Okay, I'm now really close to these values. So let's check whether we achieve the desired behavior at pin 3. Now at 100 ASA and 1 times compensation, we see an offset of 4.3655 volts. This is now at 25 ASA and 4 times compensation. 1600 ASA with one half times compensation, we get 5.0528 volts. For nine stops, I get a difference of 1.2794 volts, 142.2 millivolts.
per stop, very close to our target. So I would say the resistive dividers are calibrated correctly now, as far as we can tell without actually measuring the exposure times. Okay, some good news and some bad news. I played around with the camera a bit and the meter now reads very close to my Gossen Sixtomat. So the exposure time indicated in the viewfinder seems to be correct and a lot of stuff is working right now. The problem is that the actual exposure time that the camera makes is significantly shorter than what it indicates in the viewfinder by about one stop or a bit more than a stop. I have not yet calibrated the threshold setting that is responsible for making the actual exposure time equal to the indicated one, but the problem is that I tried to increase it and I reached the end of the adjustment range and the exposure time, the actual exposure time is still not long enough. That means we will need to do something to increase the adjustment range of this trimming resistor VR3. I will first measure the voltages at the top and bottom end of this trimmer and then we will see how we can increase the range by changing one of the resistors here. So let's now remove this resistor and measure it to see what we would need to replace it with. It's a 3 kilo ohm resistor. I would even have had a 2 kilo ohms SMD resistor to replace this 3 kilo ohms resistor with, but then I noticed that the lower resistor at the bottom of the trimmer is actually a 2 kilo ohm resistor. So what I did now is I simply swapped the two top and bottom resistors. At the bottom of the trimmer we now have 1.28 volts. At the top of the trimmer we now have 3.19 volt. It looks very good. We raised the upper end of our trimming range by about 480 millivolts, which is just about what we will need, I think, to get the camera working correctly. Now we will calibrate stop down mode. And this is a very easy adjustment based on the fact that when we set the aperture to wide open, stop down mode and open aperture mode should effectively be the same. The only difficulty is reaching the trimming resistor that is hiding below this little circuit board for the battery test switch. With the right tool, one could reach the trimmer through this hole in the circuit board, but since I don't have just the right tool and since I also want to clean this trimming resistor I will temporarily remove the little circuit board covering it. To make this easier I will also first remove the bracket around the film speed dial. I have the multimeter connected between pins 9 and 6 and our goal is to adjust this trimming resistor such that when we switch between open aperture and stop down mode that we see no change in the voltage between pins 9 and 6. Let's first measure the voltage in open aperture mode and I will now set the multimeter to measure voltage difference from this value. I switch the camera to stop down mode and we see that currently we have about 43 millivolts of difference which is not too bad but we will try to get a smaller difference. <laughs> 
I think I have it adjusted within a few millivolts now. This is open adoption mode. And this is stop down mode. Before we close the top of the camera, let's also take a look at the calibration of the battery check. I'm now powering the camera with my bench power supply so I can adjust the simulated battery voltage. And the multimeter is measuring the VREG regulated voltage between pins 7 and 12. Here's the battery check at 6 volts battery voltage. VREG is 5.567. Here's the battery check at 5.5 volts. VREG is 5.557. Here's the battery check at 5 volts. VREG is at 5.548. Welcome back to the darkroom. The camera is now on the light controller and we will now make the first series of measurements in which we actually measure the exposure time by having a photodiode behind the shutter curtains and an oscilloscope connected to the photodiode so we can exactly see for how long the photodiode is being exposed the sensitive area of the photodiode is a little less than 2 mm, so it fits within the narrowest slit that the camera will produce in the curtains for about a thousandth of a second. In addition to the exposure time, I'm making some additional measurements. I will be measuring the pin 9 voltage here, but I will be disconnecting the multimeter when I release the shutter so we do not disturb anything. So let's take some data. For such measurement series I made an automated web form that is first filled with the boundary conditions of the measurement setup. The form then automatically creates a list of test conditions with input fields for all the values to be measured. I measure the shorter times on the scope. For longer times above say 100 milliseconds I found it more convenient and just as accurate to measure the times by looking at the waveform of the noise the camera makes. What about the results? Well, they don't look good at all. It is almost as if the Pentax Electro Spotmatic would try to prove to me that it is unrepairable after all. The problem is not that we have an overall exposure error. That was expected since we have not yet trimmed the threshold adjustment. The main problem is that this error has a large random component. The exposure time provided by the camera fluctuates sometimes over several stops. We now need to find out what is the issue here. There are some things that do work. We are currently looking at the summary of all measurements done in open aperture mode. And when we look at the voltage at pin 9, the slope is quite exactly what we want it to be with 144 millivolts plus minus 1 millivolt and at an illuminance corresponding to 9 EV we get 2.35 volts which is quite exactly what we expect. So the CDS elements and log compression seem to be working just fine. The dependence of the exposure time on the set aperture is spot on and since we calibrated the aperture potentiometer to 142 millivolts per stop. This is a good sign that log expansion is really fine and has the correct slope. This is confirmed by the linear regression done based on illuminance. We see that the dependence of the exposure time both on the illuminance and on the set aperture is what we would expect. Both are very close to one stop per stop sensitivity. So both log compression and log expansion seem to be doing fine. Now we need to solve the mystery where this huge random error is coming from. I spent a couple of days debugging and I found out quite a lot of things. The most scary problem were the very irregular shutter times. And it quickly turned out that they were simply due to my impatience in releasing the shutter too quickly. In the next series of measurements, I gave the camera 3 seconds of halfway depressed shutter button before each exposure in order to stabilize the voltages. 
that turned out to give very consistent results for the shot times, so this problem is solved. The next problem was that the meter readings were totally off. It turned out simply to be that the trimming resistor had the wrong value, so either the trimming resistor had changed on its own, or I was not careful enough when handling the circuit board. Either way, the solution was just to trim it back to the value that I had thankfully measured before, and the results were good again. I swear if this trimmer changes once again, I will simply replace it by fixed resistors. Here are the new results of a somewhat longer series of measurements, and we see that the exposure times are very regular now. However, we also note the third problem, namely that stop-down metering mode is somehow acting up and giving very chaotic results. In contrast to automatic mode that is quite consistently overexposing by about half a stop. The erratic behavior in stop-down mode has a quite interesting but troublesome cause. I found that the aperture settings of the lens that I'm using do not really correspond to the nominal aperture values written on the lens or to the values communicated to the camera body via the aperture potentiometer. I made some geometric measurements of the area of the entry pupil of the lens and it turns out that while the wide open setting is quite close to the nominal value of f over 1.8, the settings for f over 4 and f over 8 are actually much wider than they should be and the aperture for f over 16 is smaller than what it should be. These geometric facts are consistent with the light measurements for aperture f over 4 and narrower, but they do not yet fully explain what happens at wide open. There seems to be an additional loss of light by about two-thirds of a stop that may be caused by effects like vignetting or maybe some angle dependence of the scattering of light in the focusing screen, depending on the angle of incidence. The combined effect of these two causes is that the actual difference in light passed by the aperture at nominal f over 1.8 and at nominal f over 4 is actually one stop less than it should be nominally. Unfortunately, I do not really see a solution to this problem because effectively the lens is lying to the camera body about the aperture setting. Any adjustment we can make can only be a compromise between erring in different directions. When I feed the actual values of the effective apertures into my calculation, we get a much more consistent picture for stop-down measurement mode. However, for the open aperture measurement in automatic mode, we then get additional errors. Since the camera body calculates the aperture based on the nominal aperture values that are transferred to the camera body via the aperture potentiometer. I also calculated what the results would be for an ideal lens that would accurately report its aperture settings to the camera body. And here we finally get results that are consistent overall with the camera overexposing by about two-thirds of a stop with the current setting. The overall bias towards overexposing can be compensated by threshold trimming, but it is also interesting to look at the deviations from this overall bias. Here's what I could read from the various statistical analyses that my script does. First, we see that a linear regression analysis of the exposure error cannot remove a lot of the residual error. This means that we cannot expect much improvement from further tweaking the linear settings that we have at our disposal. For automatic mode, we have an overall error of about a fourth of a stop on top of the overall bias. And only 13% of the corresponding variance can be removed by the linear regression analysis. This remaining linear error probably comes from a slight mismatch of the slopes of log compression and log expansion. Expressed as a standard deviation, this mismatch accounts for about a twelfth of a stop of error. If we look at the shutter time as a function of the pin 9 voltage rather than as a function of light, this removes a further 62% of the variance.
These 62% of the overall variance are therefore coming from the nonlinear errors in our light measurement. Expressed as a standard deviation, this is a deviation of about a sixth of a stop, which is actually quite close to the error that our simulations predicted. The remaining about 33% of variance are in the control of the shutter time itself by the log expansion comparator and switch circuits. As a standard deviation, we see one eighth of a stop here. To summarize, if we ignore the mismatch of the lens aperture, all the subsystems of the camera now work quite well, and more than half of the variance that we see comes from nonlinear errors in the light measurements. But even this largest part of the error is small compared to the problem that the lens aperture causes. Once all the slope adjustments are set correctly, the calibration becomes more straightforward. The first thing I verified is that the meter is indicating the correct nominal exposure times. If that would have been off, I could have done some fine tuning of the pin 3 offset in the resistive divider but I decided that the meter was good enough. So the next step was the threshold adjustment that is responsible for making the actual shutter times equal to the indicated ones. I set the light controller so that the indicated exposure time was exactly a sixteenth of a second and I then adjusted the threshold trimming such that the actual measured exposure time was also equal to a sixtieth of a second. This adjustment is extremely fiddly because the range of the trimmer is way too large for what you actually need to make this adjustment. There are two reasons that you should do this threshold adjustment at times in the middle of the timing range, like a sixtieth of a second. The first reason is that the discharge network is most precise in the middle of the timing range. The second reason is that we want to adjust the threshold adjustment in a range of times that are not affected a lot by the mechanical timing adjustment that we do afterwards. The mechanical timing adjustment only affects all the shutter times by adding or subtracting fractions of a millisecond. So the mechanical adjustment is most relevant for the shortest shutter times. That's why we first use the medium shutter times to adjust the threshold adjustment and then adjust the mechanical timing for times like uh, 500 and a thousandth of a second. Once all the trimmers were set, I secured them with some drops of nail polish and I also cleaned the circuit board with some IPA and then sprayed everything except the trimming resistors with an isolating lacquer to provide some protection against corrosion. I will now do the final mechanical adjustment and then we can install the PCB back in the camera. For the mechanical timing adjustment I will first use some acetone to get the lacquer off this adjustable contact here. Since the camera top is open during this mechanical adjustment, we cannot rely on the light measurement using the CDS elements. I will therefore force a voltage that causes the camera to indicate a 500 or a thousandth of a second and then correspondingly I will adjust the mechanical contact. I adjusted the timing and I resealed the adjustment and now it's time to put the PCB back into the camera and assemble the camera fully for some final testing.
apart from the leatherette, the camera is now reassembled and ready for the final testing. Now it's time to reapply the leatherette. I cleaned the camera body and the leatherette, removing as much of the old glue as possible without damaging the leatherette. I will be using this double-sided adhesive tape. I got this idea from a YouTube video by someone who tested several different glues for exactly this purpose. I already used it for the camera before that and the results were quite good, I think. So here's the final result. Considering that the leatherette is over 50 years old and that I did this for the second time in my life, I think the result is quite good. So here we are in the end. The camera is finished and it is working again. How well it is working? Well, after assembling the camera, I tested it again. And I was not totally satisfied with the results, so I repeated the offset and timing calibration with the camera mostly assembled. And in the end now I got the camera working within about half a stop of the theoretical exposure. I'm not completely satisfied with the result because among other things there seems to be a slight mismatch between the slopes of the log compression and log expansion. It seems the log expansion is somewhat closer to the theoretically predicted value of 138 millivolts per stop than what I measured. And as a result, the camera slightly overcompensates for changes in light. But the effect is small compared to other things affecting the exposure. For example, when we calculate what the camera will actually do with the lens, that has the miscalibrated aperture, we see that most of the time the camera will actually overexpose. And on top of that, we have many other effects, like the effect of the color temperature that we already discussed in a previous video. And of course, also the limitations of the center weighted measurement that the camera makes. Overall, I'm convinced that the camera will work well enough for using negative film. I'm not sure about color positive film, I will have to test it, so now it's time to put some films through the camera. Maybe I will or maybe I won't make a small update video once I have test pictures taken with the camera. There are a few loose ends and I will not be able to follow up on all of them in this video, but I checked one thing that is the power supply noise and how it's affecting the exposure. I measured quite a lot of noise on several important pins coming from the DC-DC converter in the camera. But in the end I couldn't find a strong temporal relation between the noise and when the comparator actually swings. So I do not think that the power supply noise is one of the significant problems affecting the camera. So that will be a wrap and I hope you found the videos interesting. If you want to work on this camera and you have some questions, I think it's best to post them now while things are still fresh in my mind. So thanks again to my dad who sponsored this project and thanks to you all for watching. Bye!